This episode is brought to you by Bright Cellars, a personalized monthly wine subscription. Start by taking a short, fun quiz, and the algorithm designed by two MIT grads will recommend the four best wines for your tastes based on science. You'll receive four bottles of wine per month, and you'll never receive the same bottle twice. Go to brightcellars.com slash wine to five, and you'll get 50% off your first shipment. It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five, entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. How's your morning going, wine diva Val? Did you get your yoga on? I did. Yay! Oh my gosh, yes, I did too, Miss Thang. I did. I got my sweat on too. Was had the voice live in the app on my iPad and I was like catching Sweet. up from last night. What a great way to multitask. Whether you're listening to a podcast or whatever and you're just like sweating away on the elliptical, it's pretty good. Yeah, well, and the voice, I haven't watched the voice in a long time, but man, I love that. I would crank the music up really, really loud, you know, in the house while I was watching. Uh-huh. And I would just be like, it was my dance party sometimes, depending on the song. Well, this <laughs> morning, they kicked off the lives with Jungle Love. Oh, So if you guys are out there watching The Voice, Jess from Team Adam did Jungle Love. And, you know. I'm going to have to go YouTube that. You're going to have to YouTube because it was, it was sick. And I was just on the elliptical and I went, Whoa! And I thought, oh, my God, John's going to hear this because he's getting ready for work. And I'm down in the basement like, woo, it's six o'clock in the morning. Jungle love. Yeah. And they even did the little Morris Day dance. And I just loved it. And that's just, you can't not love, you know, if if you stay seated when Jungle Love is playing, you must not have a pulse. Seriously. I know. Agreed. Yeah. Morris Day in the time. Well, and you know what else? Now that we've both got our yoga and um, booty shaking on. Right. Drinking time at 11.30. Damn, Skippy. In the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's not five o'clock. And, and we, we don't, don't care. care. <laughs> what do you got? What do you got up there? Um, I have uh, something from Burgundy. I have a 2012 Bourgogne Chardonnay, and it's from Chateau de Palmard. And uh, yeah, I got this. Um, one of my friends, Russ Donnan, was placing an order at Chateau de Palmard because he got to visit there and he Mm. said hey do you want me to order you anything and I was like I want one of each yeah (laughs) (laughs) it went something like that but I couldn't afford one of each so I got like six different bottles so just kind of a a selection and this is the the lowest priced offering they had and so this arrived uh I don't know about a month or so ago So first one I've opened on Wine 25, just for you guys. Oh, nice. And yeah, it's kind of, it's pretty cool. An excuse to really just use my Chardonnay stems, you know, because Uh how often do you use those? Like never. So here I am. It's kind of nutty and I, which I wasn't expecting, but I like it. It still has like this really youthful freshness. Um, Yeah. Cool wine. What are you drinking? I have a Rivetto 2013 Barbera d'Alba. This is the Nemes, I think is how they pronounce it. N-E-M-E-S. Looks like Nemes, but in Italian, that would be Nemes. Okay. It is delicious. The first bottle was actually corked. I had to take it back. So I got this one, and this is delightful. Yeah, it's got that, my version of of almost like a Nebbiolo-like Barbera. You know how Barbera can be really nice, dark, and inky and full-bodied and have a lot of oak treatment this one's got a lot of fresh acidity to it and the berries Mm -hmm. are just like this bramble berry bright red and black fruit it's not overly jammy this is a really elegant barbera i like the lighter style more elegant styles of barbera i mean there is such a spectrum so they can be really bright and almost you know really light like you said like almost like nebbiolo ish Mm-hmm. Or, and you can't compare them. So if you're listening and you go, oh, there's nothing like a Nebbiello and a Barbera, you know, you know what I'm trying to say here. Or they That's can be right. brooding. They can be really brooding as well. And so there's there's a spectrum when it comes to Barbera that I love. It's a very versatile grape. So I'm digging, I'm digging this. Absolutely. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, you definitely have to be more familiar with the producer when it comes to Barbera because the style 
when you go searching for Barbaros can be so different. And if you're looking for one, you might be opening something else. So Absolutely. Yeah. And I should add that this is in my wine enthusiast fusion break resistant free replacement stem. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wine enthusiasts. Oh Woo-hoo! my gosh. Yes. We've replaced so many of these. Oh. I mean, they're brake resistant, but you know, every once in a while, one one takes a tumble, and like I said, sometimes mm-hmm. they bounce and sometimes they don't. So yeah, yeah they're yeah. great. But what are we talking about today besides the voice, wine, and stemware, and books, and books? So, yes. Yeah, so we're doing a book review of the Sideways sequel called Vertical Passion and Pinot on the Oregon Wine Trail, and written by Rex Pickett. This is really exciting because I think this may be our very first audiobook review. It is. We talk about books all the time, but we've never we've never really read a book and then, you know, discussed it on on the show. It's like a book club. I know, a Wine 25 book club. Yes, and this isn't a review of the audio book. I, I think when I said audio book review, it made it sound like we're reviewing an audio book. No, this is an audio version of a book review. Yeah. A book review captured in audio. Yes. So yes. Uh, fasten your seatbelts. I don't, I don't know why I have like images. Of, when I look at you today across the Skype and I'm looking at our notes and we've got our headphones on, we got our wine and we're talking about a book review. Images of that Saturday Night Live skit when they're Which imitating one? they're imitating NPR. Well, I'm thinking of sweaty balls for one, but <laughs> the delicious dish. I think it's like Molly Shannon. No. Look up NPR Saturday Night Live and you will get it because okay. I'm starting to think, oh, my God, we got to keep it lively or we're going to be we're going to be a, a Saturday Night Live skit. And we don't want that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? I'd be like, what is happening right now? I'm in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> I, mean, I know. And it's weird that I know a pop culture reference that you don't because I'm like so square. It's you true. know, and you're like, it's not one. true that you're square, but it is true that. <laughs> But it is true that you know you know a lot of pop culture. Don't be telling anybody that, Val. <laughs> well, comparatively, there are a lot of things that go over my head, but this book was not one of them, I have to say. But before we get started, did you read the Sideways book? No, you know, I didn't. And I made a note in, in when I was reading the book, too, that now I kind of want to actually read the book because... I'd only watched the movie and, you know, here's the thing. I didn't really like the movie. I didn't like the sideways movie because, you know, Miles and Jack drove me freaking bananas. And so <laughs> I have to admit the same thing. I was uh, not a fan of the movie. I mean, it had its funny moments, like when he drank the spit bucket, yeah. which is mentioned in this book, by the way. So the funny moments of the movie do resurge into the book yes, which do. is really nice they show up again but yes i have to admit that sideways was not one of my favorite wine movies because i thought miles was frankly a slob right and pathetic and he made bad life choices and he was definitely not somebody i would date right it was so frustrating i thought to watch but now since i've read vertical i'm like I wonder if I would really like reading the first book now that I've read this sequel and maybe look at it with different eyes because I'm in such a different place in my life now with the wine and traveling and and wine tourism and stuff that I kind of think it would be maybe I have a new perspective. But yeah, it's funny that you didn't read the book either. No, I, I didn't even know about it. The movie came out and it was a cult favorite. And so I'm like, all right, I'll go see it. I'm like, yeah, it was okay. It was one of those like blockbuster rentals back in when blockbuster was right down the street from me. Yeah. And it was one of those things. And I almost wonder as I read this and you start feeling a lot more compassion for Miles. I mean, when, when right. it starts out, when the book starts out, you're like, oh, here we go. This guy's a hot mess. Yeah, I'm going to want to kick his ass by the end of the second chapter. But yet as the book progresses and as this trip happens, I don't know if there's an awakening with Miles, but there's also a more of an attachment that you get to this character and empathy, if you will. Oh, definitely. Maybe the first book was meant for him to come across the way he did. Because when you look at who he is in this book, he's trying to clean up his act. And he really, he really does kind of... I'm not going to say transform, but 
how do, how would you describe that? His well, character. He did come kind of full circle. And I think that's why it's fun to read the book because you're kind of going with with him through his quote journey or you know, his, his the whole process. And I didn't really get anything like that from from the movie. So I don't really that's I think why I'm so curious about reading the first book. But that's why I like this book, because I did feel like, you know, yeah, maybe he did transform or we got to see him in a new light. I definitely started to have some empathy for him, like you were saying. And his his mom and the scenarios, I mean, it just makes you shake your head. You can't really stop reading it. I mean, it's just one thing after another, which you're just like. This is really entertaining. <laughs> it know? really was. And that's yeah. it was like one night because I like to read in bed before I yeah. go to sleep and I like to read fiction. Yeah. Because I don't want my mind to start swimming before bed. So I love I love like a real book, like a paper book like this is, and the nice the light next to the bed and just to curl up with a book. And I know one night I just could not put it down. I think it was something with his mother and the dog. I don't know what was going on, but I had to see what was going to happen with this dog. And oh, the dog. The dog. Yes. And I'm just like, and I could not put the book down. And John finally, you know, usually he'll just fall ready to sleep, but he finally rolls over. It's like, it's 11 o'clock. Are you going to are you going to turn out the light anytime soon? And that's the bad thing about reading a book that's not on the Kindle or the iPad yeah. because you got to have the light on. But I was like, I felt so selfish because I was just like, I, I was like, but I can't because I got to find out what happens to this dog and his mother. And it was just, and the giggling. My gosh. I don't care where you are. And, and I'm writing about this in this book review that wherever you are, you're going to annoy anybody around you with this book. Because if you're sitting on the plane reading it, you're snickering and you're snorting. And if you're And in you're bed, like shaking your head no, like this isn't happening. And then you start cracking up. And then if you're in bed, you know, like he'd be reading and I'd be, we both like to read in bed. And he'd be reading and I'd be reading and I'd be like, <laughs> Oh my yeah, God, I my was God. that girl on the plane. I was the girl reading on the plane, and then somebody's just like looking over at me. And I was also the girl on the plane, and that kept ordering drinks and like taking pictures. I think of my book and my drink. And <laughs> oh my God, I think the last time I laughed out loud this this hard on a plane, I was reading. Oh, no, it was what I was doing while you were breeding last summer. But before that, it was Bridget Jones's Diary. And that had to be like in 2001. Yeah, God. That's I was reading Bridget Jones's Diary, the sequel, Edge of Reason. And I was reading it on a Southwest flight. And I remember this flight attendant like coming over and looking at my book. She goes, oh, my God. Yeah, I read that. That's hilarious. I had to see what you were laughing at. But this that was probably the last time I laughed this hard just with yeah. a book in my lap. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I think the book is definitely a comic relief. Oh, yeah. Well, and like I was trying to put some words together to describe it. And really, it's like wine tourism meets comic tension. So funny. But at the same time, you kind of feel like you're on a travel book. You know, it's yeah. just. And I, I don't know, maybe th there are some other great books that have travel and humor and, you know, but this one, I think because it's so specific to wine, it's not just, you know, a funny travel story. Right. I, right. I just loved it so much. And I don't know that I have like a favorite, a favorite part or, but the whole veterinarian thing, I, oh, I don't know, like if we should spoil it by telling people all about the book, but that dog plays such an important role role in the story and then you know going to the vet and what unfolds with this not just the the vet the doctor but yeah. everything else that happens at the veterinary clinic is just and then jack when he took too much viagra Oh my god! I figured as a pharmacist you'd appreciate that but I that did. was hilarious I called this book the gift of giggles with yeah. sultry, sexy, and downright slutty moments. And I said, let's face it, wine does that to all of us. Because there was a, so much suspense. 
Yeah. I set it rogered up with some suspense, sharp turns, and, and then a modicum of truth because with the respect of the world of wine. It did. There was so much truth in that book. And what I was really surprised to find was a lot of the scenes weren't made up. There really is a just in. Yeah. At Justin Winery. Oh, I know. Oh, here's the other thing we definitely have to talk about. The vocabulary that Rex uses and then the glossary in the back because it's not common language. I mean, you're stumbling over some of the words he's chosen. Yeah. And I'm like, what is going on with this? An antiodromia, you know, the opposite of something. It's like you're looking up words you think you're looking up words, you know, you're, it's like going to the Oxford Companion of Wine, except looking up <laughs> words like uh, Bacchanal and Anatriodromia, yeah. you know, and all these French words and words that are related to the wine industry that somebody who isn't in the industry may not know or isn't a cork dork, for example. And, yeah. and just when you thought your vocab was all that. Oh, yeah. You read well, this you book. you were sadly mistaken. <laughs> I flip to this glossary almost. I'm, I'm like, how do I know that this word is in the glossary? I just know it is, you know, or I yeah. thought I knew that word. Or maybe I didn't. So you actually got a little bit of an education on top of that. And, and his writing is just, it's not snotty. When you're using those kind of words, you think it's going to be a little bit pretentious. Right. And it's not. I mean, it's a riot. It it's a riot. It's heartwarming. There's some sadness, there's some laughter, lots of sex. Lots of lots of sex. Lots More of More than sex. any other wine book I've ever read or heard about. And I kind of thought it was cool, though, because, you know, wine and sex are two of our greatest human pleasures. Right. I'm like, why are we not putting those two together in story form more often? <laughs> I know. I don't know if the first book was like that or not, because there was plenty of it in the movie. Yeah. So I guess, you know, it, it would be interesting to go back and read sideways and see, because a lot of times the books and the movies don't parallel. Right. That's, yeah, I think that's why I'm like, you know, that might be a, a good read for the summer is to go back and Revisit sideways. Yeah. And and then you mentioned also the black and white illustrations. Yeah. I thought those were, you know, I not very often do you see that in a book like this. And uh, Michelle Phillips is the illustrator. And I thought those little black and white drawings really accentuated and kind of assisted your imagination in the scene. So I, I appreciated that a lot. I mean, it was not overdone with a lot of il illustrations, but I thought it was kind of fun seeing those pop up like that. I agree. I think they did a really nice job on that as well. So I think all in all, this book has a lot of different elements to it. A, a wine list, for example. I think Foxen is definitely on my wine radar now because we had just at the end of the trip that I mentioned that paralleled their road trip. I was on a three week trip mostly on the east coast and at dinner one night it went on during one of my trips there was a conversation about fox and winery yeah and then i read it in the book and i was like okay so it's a real thing or i just read it in the book and then we had a conversation i'm like oh so it is a real winery and you know somebody had met the winemaker 30 years later again and talked about the winery and now their wines are kind of on my list because they're exclusive and there's just this so wine recommendations if you love pinot noir first of all oh yeah you bet i mean there's a it's a great resource to try new Oregon Pinots and, and not just Pinot Noir. I mean, there's a lot of references to all sorts of wines. And like you were mentioning, even the Justin Winery and Pasta Robles. But I mean, th there's there's a lot going on in that book with, right. you know, wine tourism, like I said. But even even just, I mean, you let's get real. Just go on the Internet and you can order some of these wines, you mm -hmm. know, from their wine clubs or, or just directly from the winery. So... That's a cool way, too, to do it. I mean, you could do that ahead of time before you even start reading and kind of drink along. I think I think that would be a good way to do it. Yeah, just I wish. Do they even have? I think they do in the back of the book if you want to drink along. Yeah, I there's a I think there's another yes. resource in there. Yeah. Yep. Itinerary of wines and locations for Miles and Jack's vertical road trip. So they're all listed in the back of the book. So you've got a wine list. The book has everything. I give it two thumbs up. How about you? Oh, yeah. Two thumbs up and a cheers. A cheers. Cheers to Rex. Cheers to Rex. 
<laughs> oh, my gosh. oh, that's good. I like these uh, book reviews. That's... I like the idea of having a Wine to Five book club. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea. We should uh, take some suggestions. Absolutely. So listeners, next if you're book. out there, or authors, if you're out there, you know, mm-hmm. send us a book. We can get our, our listeners on board and we can uh, we can have a have a book club. Yeah, I like that. I like that too. What so. else? Let's talk about some more Pinot. What's the factoid? The factoid. We thought it would be cool to tie the factoid in with the book. And Steph and I, as usual, were on the same wavelength. It's really crazy. But in this book, Miles and Jack are going to attend the International Pinot Noir Festival because by this time, Miles is a famous author because of the Sideways movie, which is paralleled in the book, but they call it Shameless in the book. So it's kind yeah. of funny. It's kind of like that whole Bones, you know, how that works with the forensic anthropologist in real life, you know, series with the show Bones and all that. So he is actually, by this time, has money and he's emceeing at all these wine events. And of course, the International Pinot Noir Festival is is a big deal. So yeah, it's a big deal. So much so that I haven't been there yet, but it's like on the dream bucket list. It, it is. And actually, it's the International Pinot noir it's not festival celebration excuse me international pinot noir celebration is a big deal it's a real thing like many things in the book you know like we mentioned fox and winery in california justin even though they don't make pinot noir they do have the just in bnb on the premises well this is a real thing too so a few fun facts about the international pinot noir celebration that they go to in this book for one it's held at the end of july this year it would be the 28th through the 30th of july so it's a thing and you can go. It's in its 31st year. That's a long time. I want to say the first year was in the 80s. Yep, of course. And oh. yeah, if we do the math. And it is $1,295 for the whole weekend of festivities. But you look at all the dinners and the champagne brunch and all these things that are, because remember, champagne is got made with Pinot Noir. And it's got a lot of stuff. About 800 people register for this thing every year. Wow, that's a lot of people. And that's my whole thing. I don't, you know me, I'm not a big crowd person. So I'm like, right. oh, I like my own personal experience. I don't want to be in a crowd. And, and things yeah. get kind of rowdy in the book. So if it's anything like in the book, well, you know, you can bet that there's a lot of fun. Over 70 producers are expected to be there. And of course, over 250 wines can be tasted at this event with over 60 coastal chefs that participate. So there's a salmon dinner. That is a thing. It's mentioned in the book, but it also is a real thing. And it's like wine camp on steroids, girl. I, I, (laughs) I wish I had nothing better to do than to pay to go to these things. Well, and it's twice as many people as our society of wine educators wine camp. So that's, you know, goodness, that's an intense celebration let's just say (laughs) it it is it's truly a celebration so we'll go ahead and link up the website if any of you guys have nothing better to do with your time and money than to go hang out at ipnc.org and honestly i wish i had nothing better to do and i could afford it because i would be there just at least for most of it you know for the stuff that wasn't pure on bacchanal or debauchery or whatever was going on there (laughs) like the book <laughs> like the book those book those words are in the back of the book you can look them up so uh, yeah. what about what about wino radar for you i'm still on the pinot pinot noir kick oh. because i found yeah for my wino radar a drinkable pinot noir in a can okay this is why i'm impressed because i find it very difficult to find a drinkable pinot noir in a bottle that's not Forty dollars or more. Okay, right. You know that is really challenging. And I uh, was introduced to these little mini cans mm-hmm. from the Great Oregon Wine Company by my buddy Hillary Siebels. Now she she brought me a can. She's like, "You've got to taste this." She's like, "This is pretty darn good for a can." And I must say, it's good. Remember, it's in a can, so you know you don't have like great expectations. But for a single serve, I thought it was really good. I poured it into a nice wine glass for Justin and didn't tell him and didn't show him the can. And then later on, I was like, what do you think of that Pinot Noir? He's like, yeah, I really like it. It's really good. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is good. And so then I tasted it. I hadn't even tasted it. I gave it to him first. And yeah, it really surprised me. So 
this is the this is definitely the kind of thing that should be and probably will be at some point on the airplanes and at the golf course at the movies and all that stuff except there's no drinking vessel included so and i didn't i didn't give it the one two and like give it a sip out of the can I can't yeah. drink anything out of a can. I don't want to yeah. drink beer out of a can. I don't want to drink. I've got to have a glass. Right. Yeah. And so I poured it into a glass. I mean, it's not quite like, you know, our ready to drink packaging buddy Gary. You know, it's not it's not yeah. like it's in its own cup. It's not in a wine glass or anything like that. But but maybe I'll have to try it next time right out of the can. Uh. But I think it's really cute, like on the little can because it's smaller than it's smaller than a normal like Coca-Cola can or a beer can. And it does say one can equals one glass of wine. So I don't think so it's probably eight ounces. I then. think it might be seven ounces. That's even better. Yeah. Because nobody can't needs remember to have a 10 I ounce relationship with a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Although Is we do on podcast day. Glass? Whose glass are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. But you know what? If you're like what we did when we went to Podfest, we took our Govino glasses with us. You yeah, know, you take that sucker on a plane and yeah, give me your can of wine and pop it on in, you know? Yeah, dude, you seriously, you just, I have some pictures of it that I can, uh, you know, we can link it oh, into man. our um, show notes, but it doesn't say how many ounces it is. I think it's probably like seven ounces, but yeah, you could throw a couple of those in your bag with some Govino cups anywhere you're traveling and you got to check your bag, but still, there you go. Yeah. Brava, brava. Yeah. So oh. find that. Find that in your liquor store. Find that in your liquor store. <laughs> Put that in What your have you on. got on your radar? On my wino radar, it just showed up this morning. Apparently, there is a new documentary coming out, and I'm excited about it. I believe I, I squeed to the person who tweeted it, and I said, I just squeed myself a little. I went, <laughs> but it's not about somps. It's... I'm not going to say it's not about vines, but it's about wine. But it's not about podcasters, these things that we love. But it is about, dun, 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 <laughs> masters of wine. Yeah. I'm like, what? So we're going to link up the trailer for you guys. And from what I can tell, it's going to be a five-part series. It's going to feature some famous producers like Trimbach, Druin, Gigal, Igigal. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll link the project at farmhousefilm.com we'll link it up in our blog for you guys but i'm pretty stinking excited about it because i i think it's going to be more like masters of wine production and not so much about the project process of becoming a master of wine which i was kind of hoping it would be because you know i'm geeky like that and and i'm toying with the idea you know maybe once i finish this other degree i've decided to get i might go ahead and go ahead and apply for that so i was kind of hoping for Something that's like Psalm, but for Masters of Wine. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. So that's that's on my wine o radar right now. And thanks to Master of Wine, Tim Atkin, for uh, sending me some information on that. And we'll link it up for you guys. Cool. I'm looking forward to that, too. I Put know. that in my queue. Put that in your queue. <laughs> <laughs> and we definitely have to give a shout out today for the publisher of this book and the PR person, Lee, who hooked us up and sent us each a copy of uh, Vertical, yeah. and the publisher is Loose Gravel Press. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Val and I were so excited when these arrived, and it's been a fun read and even more fun doing a book review on the show. I felt like a celebrity when that book came. Yeah. I was like, oh, look, we're, we're, like, we're like important now. People send us books to read. <laughs> I thought that was really cool, but anyway. Well, it, I think what is also very appropriate is that Val and I love to read. I actually said to Justin the other day, have you ever heard of the Century Club where you read a hundred books in a year? And he's like, well, yeah, I think I just read about it in the Wall Street Journal. I'm reading the same article you did. Oh, I was like, funny. oh, okay. <laughs> but I do love to read. I don't know if I'll ever be that ambitious to read a hundred books in a year, but yeah, yeah. Love to read, definitely. Absolutely. Bring on some more wine books. Oh, yeah. What about some Patreon love? Yeah, let's give some Patreon love because we love our Patreons, duh. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's send out some love to our tenacious tasters. 
Jeff E. from the We Like Drinking podcast, Lynn from Savor the Harvest blog, and our tenacious taster, Sebastian, from Sassy Italy Tours. And then we have our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners. These are probably the people who love to drink when it's like, you know, 1130 in the morning like Val and I. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, shout outs to Meg from South Dakota, Clay from Arizona, John in California, Andrew in Illinois, and Aswani in California. Thank you so much. And for everybody else, you know you can jump on the Patreon bandwagon. You know, and if you love this show, you like what you hear, and you like spending time with Val and I, and, you know, it's almost just as like, you know, what? What did we say? $5 a month. It's like buying stuff. That's me. And Val. That's me. That's you. A glass of wine. It's like we're all going out together. And or a can a, of wine at $5. Or a can. Yeah. yeah. That's right. A can. Yeah. So why should you become a Patreon supporter? Well, you get early releases of all the episodes. You get exclusive content, shout outs, like all these shout outs and all the love and then some swag too. Yeah. And also we do have a monthly drawing and each month the winner will get a surprise wine gift and it's for any Patreon supporter at the $2 a month tastemaker listener level or higher. So if you want to find out more about all of this, you can go to our patreon.com forward slash wine to five podcast. And please share the wine to five podcast with your friends by subscribing to our show. First of all, tweeting it, linking it, Facebooking it, however you want to share it. Grab somebody's phone, help them subscribe, push play. Leave us a burning wine question or a comment on SpeakPipe. And you can hear your voice on the show or maybe an Apple podcast review or a review on iHeartRadio. That would be really nice, especially if it's a good one. Also, head over to our website because we've got a store there. If you're going to buy things anyway, like wine, books, accessories, it doesn't cost you anything to use our search box or to see the books that we're recommending for you guys. Everything is on our website, including links to Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, Google+, and you can connect with me, Val, on Twitter. I'm at Wine Gal Unboxed. I'm a little snarky out there. You've been warned. And I'm also on the Vino with Val Facebook page, Instagram, and Pinterest. And then Steph, you can find her on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest as the Wine Heroine. You can also connect with her personally on Facebook. So until next week, everybody. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine T-W-O 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips.